Thank you, the wonderful studio school, which is, it's like a dream for me. I, I, I'm not a visual artist, but I, I really love what, what, it, what goes on here. I love the people who've stood here. My friend Leo Stein, Steinberg <coughs> gave some of the finest lectures I've ever attended, and trust me, I've attended quite a few lectures. Uh, all you people know whose portrait, who did this portrait, right? It's a sergeant, obviously. It's done in 1905. And uh, <clears throat> Pulitzer's wife, Kate, had just had, his, had her part portrait painted by John, Sargent, by John Singer Sargent. <clears throat> I don't particularly like the portrait of Kate, which is why I'm not showing it to you. But um, Pulitzer said when they finally landed him to do her portrait, we'll pay anything, which artists obviously very much like to hear. Um, uh, when Sargent was painting Kate Pulitzer, Kate Davis Pulitzer's uh, portrait, he uh, was complaining about uh, one, of his, uh, port one of his portrait subjects who was the most objectionable type of money-grasping, vulgar, Sixth Avenue Jew. And of course, Pulitzer was Jewish. <laughs> Kate, I just wondered, you know, what kind of reaction does uh, Cade have as she's sitting for him. Um, Sergeant was, you know, got very tired of painting portraits, as we all know. Uh, but I, you have to see the film that we've just finished, uh, jo Joseph Pulitzer, Voice of the People, to appreciate uh, the kind of bifurcation, I know it, can, oh, there, the bifurcation of that face. The right side has been described by one of Pulitzer's uh, secretaries as, uh, well, let me read the quote. Hide with a sheet of paper, <clears throat> one half the face, the right side as you face it, and you have a benevolent middle-aged gentleman. In the film, we actually do this. We hide the left side initially. Observe now the other half, and you have the malevolent, malevolent sinister, and cruel expression of a Mephisto. So it's quite a remarkable uh, portrait, I think, 1905. Can we guess who what the sculptor was? It's a Rodin. And uh, so he, you know, he had uh, two of the great 19th century, early 20th century artists to him. Rodin said his great personality was easily seen. His head was that of a master of destiny who by the sheer who by sheer will had risen from humble beginnings. Well, that's one biographer, the guy we have on camera who's wonderful, James McGrath Morris. There's another biography by a guy called Dennis Bryan, and Bryan writes that Pulitzer refused to talk directly to Rodin. His French had become very rusty. Pulitzer's Hungarian, speaks German as a native language virtually, and uh, French for a long time, but it, it's gotten rusty. So they had to speak through a, a translator, which must have been a drag. And Rodin, of course, doing the head, wanted to have uh, Pulitzer's shirt off so they could look at the way the head sat on the uh, on his shoulders. Pulitzer said, no, I won't take my shirt off. So he finally, after many, many arguments, he, re he removed his collar and undid his top button. Only if certain strangers were not in the room. Uh, and when Rodin finished the, uh, this, the bust, he's rumored to have said, I have just done the bust of a man who is un diable, a devil. So it depends which biography you read. Um, portrait of Pulitzer, that's maybe the most sympathetic photograph I know of him. Uh, and there he is, slightly older. Um, Pulitzer arrived in the United States as a penniless Hungarian immigrant. He, he got out of Hungary and fought in the Civil War. Didn't see much action uh, for the northern side of the cross. And uh, started in St. Louis working on German newspapers, ended up buying them, and buying one of them, a German language paper, and uh, made a lot of money. And so um, he came to New York in 1883. Uh, so this is an excerpt from the film, kids. 
An American newspaper, it's a giant engine of history. It's an astonishing artistic achievement. I learned that the British Library, which had the very last pristine runs of Joseph Pulitzer's New York World, was getting rid of it. They said, look, it's going to be an auction. So the only way you're going to get these papers safe the way you want them to is bid on them. It's so rare in anyone's life that you get an opportunity that something comes to you and you just happen to know that if you take a few steps, if you take a few risks, that you can save it. If you have the last copy Let's say you're the Shakespeare first folio and there's only one left. What price do you come up with? I had no idea. And that's how I got to know about Joseph Pulitzer, who is probably the most thrilling and important and original and creative mind in American media that has ever been. He's the person who thought up so much of what we think of now as news and how news is conveyed. What did the president know and when did he know it? Also two media centers uh, built. Whoa. Tonight, Iraq stability at stake. You can hear some clashes, some gunfire. what it means to be an investigative reporter and why it's worth it. Mark Hosenball's national security reporting after 9-11. Joseph Pulitzer was a relentless journalist known for making enemies. A lifetime insomniac, he rarely stopped editing, learning, criticizing, and only occasionally praising. His restless temperament was well suited to the ceaseless pace of publishing a daily newspaper. In his final years, when he was blind, Pulitzer waged one last battle. He accused President Theodore Roosevelt of lying to the American people. On December 15, 1908, the world called the Panama Canal Roosevelt's proudest achievement, an act of colonial aggression. The paper insisted that the government account for a missing $40 million claiming that the money was lining rich men's pockets. In sense, Roosevelt sent a fiery letter to Congress accusing Pulitzer of libel and threatening to put him in prison. Roosevelt stated, It is a high national duty to bring to justice this vilifier of the American people. Pulitzer fought the accusations as an attack on the press, even on democracy itself. How did Joseph Pulitzer, once a penniless Jewish immigrant from Hungary, come to defy a popular president and lead the fight for a free press until his death in 1911? That is the opening of the film. Um, Pulitzer's papers paper in New York, which is called The World. Uh, he took it over in 1883, and it was selling something like 15,000 copies a day. In a decade, it was hugely successful, 400 grand there. They were selling 5 million a week at a certain point. This is the Spanish Civil War. 
appeared a million a day um, during this, in 1898. This it also, oh, I can do this this way. Uh, it's the first, his world paper is the first national paper, and there's a beautiful kind of pan of, I'm sorry that we can't see it a little better, but um, clearly most of the circulation is in the east, but it went all the way across the country. It, wildly popular, and for, for reasons, because they were so inventive, I love this uh, cartoon of Pulitzer. That's a model of, of the um, Hoe Press, which I'll talk about a little later. The Hoe Press were fed on rolls five miles long, the paper. And of course, there was a huge change in the technology of um, newspaper, of, of printing in general. <clears throat> they went from rag paper, which meant you, you bought rags and you removed buttons and things like that, to uh, pulp paper, which just mashed up this stuff and used it again. So you could have enormous rolls. And also, it became much cheaper because you could recycle this stuff and the initial cost was not very much. And there he is circling the globe. Uh, Pulitzer's paper was popular because it appealed, is that me, did I do that? Oh, good, uh, I hope everybody's okay. Uh, it appealed to so many audiences, including uh, obviously to people who wanted to cut their dresses out of the newspaper. Um, they also had sheet music, so you could buy sheet music and sing along with this stuff. If you happen to have a piano at home, um, you could play it. So it, it just a remarkable sense of an audience, a growing audience in, these, in New York in particular, which of course was expanding, expanding exponentially in the 1880s and 1890s and 1900s with all the immigrants coming. Toys for the kids, you could actually cut this out of two-dimensional paper and ink and make a three-dimensional toy for your kid on Sunday. These are all Sunday papers. And then cartoons and the comics. This is a strip called, um, initially, Hogan's Alley. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it a little later. But you can see the anarchy expressed. This is New York's Lower East Side. In the Irish neighborhood, there are no, everyone in, the, in, this, in this single panel cartoon is Irish, and they speak a kind of um, wonderful, bowery, Third Avenue, Lower East Side talk. Um, this, I have to read you the copy on this, because this is one of my favorite things in the world. Imagine waking up on Sunday and seeing this, and it's muck, muck raking mode. The world was now renowned for its exposés of political corruption and devastating anatomies of wealth abuses, including, for example, this two-page spread graphically detailing the mind-boggling extent of the Astor's family Manhattan real estate. And the copy that you can't read says, every house and every foot of Astor real estate on Manhattan Island Photographic evidence of wealth accumulated by one family that taxes human credulity. Quote, it would line a thoroughfare seven miles long. A brisk walk of two hours would not traverse it, passing $15,000 worth of property every step. I mean, can you imagine the Astor family gathered around the breakfast table saying, holy cow, he's nailed me, he got me. Um, Pulitzer believed in the efficacy of the press, and it wrote as an editorial, <clears throat> there is not a crime, there is not a dodge, there is not a trick, there is not a swindle, there is not a vice that does not live by secrecy. Get these things out in the open, describe them, attack them, ridicule them in the press, and sooner or later, public opinion will sweep them away. There is nothing wrongdoing so much desires as to be let alone, but it never has been since the printing press got fairly in motion. So, uh, you know, he was, he was really, really um, a campaigner, crusader against the bad people, and the, particularly among, against a lot of wealth. Of course, he became enormously wealthy. He, when he died in 1911, his estate was over $17 million, so you can imagine uh, how, uh, 
how rich he was. I asked, we, you'll see later, um, I believe their 73rd Street townhouse, which was designed by the Kim Mead and White. And um, in order to get a kind of sense of the scale of the wealth, I asked the guy who's the head of the co-op who has the top two floors, a lovely man called David Redden, who was a, a rare books guy at Sotheby's for years, uh, how he would describe the wealth of the Pulitzers. And he said, well, on this floor alone, there were seven maids' rooms. So you get an idea of seven maids' rooms. Uh, this is video. Another he buys a failing newspaper. Pulitzer would take it to all new levels in terms of uh, the size of his readership, in terms of the level of excitement and energy and action in the pages itself, and in terms of the visual presentation of news. When he was finished, journalism was unrecognizable from the way it had existed before him. There is room in this great and growing city for a journal that is not only cheap, but bright. Not only bright, but large. Not only large, but truly democratic. Dedicated to the cause of the people that will expose all fraud and sham, fight all public evils and abuses that will serve and battle for the people with earnest sincerity. We just went nuts when we found that footage. It, it, you know, it's very early, and there it is, the world. I love this. Can you see the, the way the artist did this? Pulitzer's made and get it in this. It's quite wonderful, I think. Um, Pulitzer, as I said, became quite wealthy. One of his early, this is the wonderful St. Louis uh, bridge by James Eads, which was really the first bridge, the big bridge to cross the Mississippi. And Eats was a good friend. They, uh, Pulitzer spent quite a bit of time in St. Louis, which was uh, half German at the time, and he spoke German, as I said earlier. And Eats came up with this plan, not only for the bridge, which was um, the first all steel construction, one of the longest bridges of the time, time, and it was built high enough so that steamships could pass under it. The, steam, the steamship lobby was insanely annoyed by this bridge, but it was very cleverly done. But each, not only was an engineer, the Mississippi River was silting up at the mouth of the Mississippi, um, and each came up with a plan of jetties, wooden jetties that directed the flow and created a backflow so that the river would clean itself out. Pulitzer was smart enough to invest in this, and when, when uh, each got the multi-million dollar contract from the Army Corps of Engineers, Pulitzer's immediate future was made, and he looked for a girlfriend, and that's Kate Davis Pulitzer. At the age of 31, it was time to woo, to woo an appropriate wife and start at least a family, if not a dynasty, and he went after an attractive St. Louis uh, young woman who turned him down, and then he met Kate. and. Um, <clears throat> According to St. Louis life, she uh, was beautiful, of the clear gypsy type, with a rich color and great melting eyes. I think you can see that in uh, the photograph. Um, Kate was from, the name was Davis. The surname was Davis. She was a distant uh, uh, niece of uh, Jefferson Davis, of the, the president of the Confederacy. Pulitzer was a Hungarian Jew, but he lied to his, her parents saying he was, his mother was Catholic. Uh, so in any event. Uh, but Kate gave him access to what uh, he wanted, which was uh, the higher echelon, social echelons. They were married in a church in Washington, D.C., the church of the Episcopal Church of the uh, Epiphany, which is one of the upscale churches. And by then, he was ready to get out of St. Louis and uh, start a life in New York City as a publisher. Meanwhile, he kept the St. Louis Post-Dispatch 
And this is, you know, just one representation of what life on the Lower East Side in the poor parts of town was like. Most of the papers had not paid any attention to the poor and to the immigrants, and Pulitzer was smart enough to realize that they had made a huge mistake. This is a guy called Jay Gould, who was a financier, one of the, one of the worst people in the world, who, who Pulitzer, Pul Gould had picked up a paper in one of his many deals. It was a failing paper called The New York World. And Pulitzer had said of Gould, let me just find the, the quote, here he is, um, who was described as the most hated man in in uh, America, the, he and his partner, uh, Jim, uh, what the hell was the guy's name? I mean, Fisk, uh, cornered the gold market at one point and ordered, got a lot of grain, and they, they were playing with current, with the price of the dollar. Pulitzer in the St. Louis Post Dispatch had said of Gould that he was one of the most sinister figures that have ever flitted bat like across the vision of the American people. So you can imagine. Gould was not going to give him a very good price on the newspaper. Uh, variously, the film says 400 grand was the price of this failing newspaper. Uh, I, I thought it was 360, but in any event, it's around $400,000. And of course, Gould assumed that Pulitzer would go broke. Pulitzer's timing in coming to New York, you know, some people are both very smart and, and uh, just managed to catch the wave. Well, he came to New York City in 1883, in May of 1883, and they started the paper 10 days before the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge, which of course was the wonder of the world. The city fathers, uh, full, no mothers in the game at that point, um, made a big mistake because they, they had a freight toll on it, but they, they made the mistake of charging one penny for pedestrians. Has everybody walked across the bridge, by the way? If you haven't done it, don't do it now because it's getting cold. It's one of the most wonderful ways to experience New York City. I, 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 it's just a beautiful, beautiful walk, and it's a remarkable structure, obviously. Um, anyhow, these dummies put a um, one cent pedestrian toll on the bridge. And so the next day, 10 days after he, after he bought the paper, <clears throat> the banner headline declared, let the bridge be free because it is a great public work paid for with the people's money. Do not impose an unfair and unnecessary tax. Remember, every day these people cross the river to build our city. One penny is a workman's lunch. Now imagine what the poor people of New York, the immigrants who were struggling, thought that they finally had a champion. They finally had someone who cared about them. And that, that's a building, that is his building, which isn't completed until 1890, called the Pulitzer World Building. Uh, this is, you know, more, more, I just love the structure, so forgive me if I indulge myself. Uh, now, film. And, uh, I'm gonna try, okay, gently, ah, I think I have it, I may have it. Come on. Yes. Oh, I don't know. Ah, almost, oh, almost said it. Thanks. Here we go. Josh can do it. You'll recognize the building completed in 1911. The, Never the, tolerate injustice or corruption. Always oppose privileged classes and public plunder. Never lack sympathy for the poor. Never be afraid to attack her own. Always be drastically independent. Pulitzer sees them not just as a vast market, potentially profitable, he also sees them as people who need a newspaper, who need a newspaper that's gonna stand up for their interests. So he's always got this mix of understanding the market and understanding how to make a good profit, but also he's devoted to the interests of people who don't have champions. He was accused of being a sensationalist. His response was, I am reporting on what really happens in the world. There are crimes in the world. There are divorces in the world. 
There's scandals in the world. Why shouldn't that be part of what a newspaper reports? But of course, his, his genius was he didn't just wait for these things to happen. He had a notion of the news, not just that you report it, but you also make it. Pulitzer first made news when the majestic Brooklyn Bridge opened in May 1883, only 10 days after he purchased the world. In their tone-deaf quest for revenue, the city fathers levied a one-penny pedestrian toll. The world splashed a four-column woodcut illustration of the Great Suspension Bridge across its front page and demanded, Let the bridge be free. A penny is a workman's lunch. The working classes of the city do not enjoy many privileges. Let them at least have free schools, free air, free daylight, and a free bridge. Pulitzer's challenge could not have been more timely. Working people quickly understood that a fearless new champion had come to town. So conveniently, <clears throat> the next year, this beautiful, wonderful Statue of Liberty arrives in New York Harbor. But anyone know the story about the Statue of Liberty? It sits in crates for a year on a rat-infested or rat-infested piers in Brooklyn. Why? Because they're lacking $100,000 to put it together, to reassemble the first monument made from a kit, essentially. Uh, Bartholdi put it together in Paris, they disassembled it, and then they brought it over here. Congress didn't want to do anything about it. The rich people in New York said, uh, what do we care about a Statue of Liberty? And so Pulitzer had his second crusade, and he said, let's all pitch in. It doesn't matter how little you send me. Send a penny, send a nickel, send a dime. We're going to put this thing up. And that's what they did. And finally, and anybody who, named, who sent in a penny, nickel, dime, dollar, um, their name would appear in the paper. So, I mean, talk about marketing. Talk about the first crowdfunding <laughs> that I know of. Uh, please receive a dollar from two little boys. It is our savings. We give it freely. Brooklyn, Brooklyn, uh, <clears throat> 50 cents from the sale of a hen. So this is a new form of participatory democracy. And uh, what he's saying to the people of New York, immigrants and poor, and it could have been rich people too, um, your part, I care about you. I'm listening to what you have to say. And in 1866, 1886 rather, the, uh, the, the pedestal, the foundation is completed. Big celebration in the harbor. Pulitzer by then is go, starting to go blind, but also finds noise intolerable. So he does not go to the celebration. The man who put the, the statue there. And this is a, it's not Tiffany, but it's a stained glass piece that Pulitzer had made for his office. It's now at Columbia <clears throat> at the journalism school. Uh, and it's quite wonderful. So, um, Pulitzer comes to New York City just at the moment when the city's large enough that people have to commute to work. 1904, the first, um, subway station under his. Just look at this for a moment. I think it's so beautiful. And you see, of course, there are multiple layers, to, levels to it. And in the background center is the Pulitzer's world building again. Um, that actually still exists. It's, it's covered up, but it's the city hall subway station. Uh, I think you can get access to it if you know somebody. Uh, again, um, this is a, a very important technological advance, the Ho, R. Ho, Robert Ho. This uh, machine could turn out from the five paper, five mile paper roll, 12,000, 16,000, 20,000 copies per hour, folded, pasted, bundles of 25 or 50, depending on the thickness of the paper, of the paper of the, that day, how many pages it was, 8, 16, 32. And again, fashion over there. So this, th these were really quite marvelous technological innovations. Did anyone see the post, the, the, the uh, film about the Washington Post? 
Well, I was so jealous because they had those amazing, amazing footage of those huge rolls. This is the best we could do. We don't have their budget. Um, this, I think, is one of the things that Pulitzer was doing was saying, I want to catch your visual attention. The, the page on your right is, is quite, quite remarkable, at least in my mind. This, how high can, how high can New York City grow, grow? And those two hands pressing on the verticality. Of course, his building is the, the smaller one, because uh, although it was the, the it was 19 stories finished in 1890, um, it, it was you know soon outdone by others. The other thing that was many many things were going on, but the concentration of um, people led to the concentration of Emporia, huge uh, stores like Macy's, which here is, a, this is a later photograph, obviously, but uh, advertising itself as the largest store. Well, where do you advertise? You advertise in the newspaper. And where do you advertise? You particularly advertise in Pulitzer's newspaper because you've got an in-house design staff. You want the page vertical, you want it horizontal, you want it any way you wish, just pay us enough money. And he was the first newspaper publisher to realize and to insist that if you um, advertised, if your, if your circulation figures grew, which indeed they did, he could charge more per page. So he was a very clever rascal and a difficult man. He also happened to be Jewish. And um, there was some really nasty, nasty stuff. Um, one headline declared, the Jew who denied his race and religion. Gross characters like this were labored, labeled Joey the Jew and Judas Pulitzer, and Pulitzer was de depicted with a bulbous hooked nose, condemned as a scavenger who grows fat on filth. In the mul multiplicity of nature's freaks, there is one curiosity that will always cause us to, tur run, to turn and stare, Joseph Pulitzer, combs his hair with talons and rubs the sores around his eyes. Um, this concentration on, on uh, the visual, well, let, let me just go back to the visual a little. Concentration on the visual led a lot of people to complain, a lot of rival papers to, to complain. And uh, they said it was dumbing down the newspaper, it was only appealing to the illiterate. and, and uh, Pulitzer's, the world replied to that, the daily is like a mirror, it reflects what, that which is before it. Let those who are startled by it blame the people who are before the mirror and not the mirror, which only reflects, um, reflects their features and their actions. And the true horror of this sensationalist stuff was that New York was very, very messed up at the time. Terrible congestion, we think it was the <clears throat> most densely populated of city in the world at that time. Five blocks, 30,000 people, no citywide sewage, filthy streets. Now try this one on. Over 2.5 million pounds of horse manure had to be removed each day. I mean, you know, imagine that. Imagine what it bred. We think we have problems with cars and trucks. This is real. And, and in the summer, of course, there was no, no air. People, well, it smelled like hell, but people would go to the roofs to sleep, to escape, or to sleep on those fire escapes, and occasionally someone would roll off, particularly children and infants. So um, it was um, someone, and we'll tell you whom, uh, Jacob Reese called these deaths a human rain. So um, not a nice picture. Kate. Kate uh, was an incredibly um, clever person, I think. Uh, she wrote to her husband, it was very, very difficult. I wish there was more sunshine in your life. Worry and wearisome work are dull companions, a little more deaf. We make tragedies of our lives, yet most of us are not even making them serious comedies. Um, and then, but her, and she, she also, he would grill her, in spite of the fact they had a lot of money, every month he would grill her about the monthly bills. Every penny had to be accounted for. So it wasn't a particularly uh, easygoing relationship. And at one point in her diary, she complains, he said, I did not understand the proper relation between husband and wife. 
There is not a servant in the house who works harder than I have. I made a slave of myself. Uh, the one thing that she wouldn't let him get away with was his abuse of their three male children. The youngest one, Herbert, was born in 1897. He doesn't really figure in the kind of vitriol of uh, the early vitriol, but Pulitzer wrote to his sons, you and Joseph Jr. should never forget the dangers that unfortunately attend and hurt us. That's, that's the oldest son, Ralph. <clears throat> that you should never forget the dangers, unfortunately, of ten inheritance of large fortunes, the obvious temp temptation of enervating luxury and withdrawal from wholesome duty, the wholesome duties of vigorous, serious, useful work. It is my fervent hope that when this inheritance falls to you, <clears throat> you too will re fully realize your responsibility, Ralph and Joseph Jr. Unfortunately, to date, I remain skeptical about your talents and commitment to the enterprise. So clearly, he was not an easy dad to have. He was much better and much nicer to the women uh, because there wasn't that same competitiveness nor the sense that they were going to take over this legacy. Um, in 1889, he went pretty much totally blind at the age of 43, which occasioned his withdrawal from the paper, sort of. Um, what he did was uh, spend most of his time out of New York City. Uh, let me get to the world building before I get into that. That's Ralph um, being uh, a goof off, and I think that's Joe Jr. behind him, but I can't be sure. And that's Joseph when his eyes were gone. He wore, wore goggles. These are simulations of it. We think this is a, not a uh, video. You think it's just a still? Anyhow, it's okay. Uh, there's his building. Uh, it goes up in 1889, comes in on schedule, and it costs him about a million bucks. The unusual feature of it was that dome, which was gilded, and this dome could be seen from 40 miles at sea. So um, the first two landmarks, that have, there it is again, the first two landmarks, in the film it's really slick because we gild both of those things that you see when you're in the harbor approaching New York City, Pulitzer's World Building and the Statue of Liberty, both of which he effectively erected. So it's, it's a pretty impressive kind of, I put my stamp on, uh, on New York City, which was then extraordinary colossus. In 1954, Robert Moses knocked the building down to make a, more car access to the Brooklyn Bridge. There it goes. And this is um, really a remarkable step forward in terms of illustration and art and in terms of uh, the popularity of the world and, and then, of course, other newspapers. I date the color introduction in the Daily Newspaper in 1895 with this cartoon or this, this uh, <clears throat> uh, single panel. Uh, drawing of, again, the yellow kid, who's this goofball in the yellow smock. It's a little faded there, but he's, he looks like an idiot, but he actually says very interesting things in a, in a street language, in an argo. There's somebody falling down. It's all this anarchy and madness, and uh, there are always a lot of steins as well. I, I'm sorry these don't come out as well as I'd like them to, but... Uh, there are newsprint stuff. There's a yellow kid. Well, Holly G, here's to you. And he's got his champagne. In. And this one I love. That's a streetcar, obviously. A lot of bikes, a lot of tours. Um, so Pulitzer introduces color in 1895 to the, to the Sunday papers. And you get, you know, an explosion of these things. Before that, Papers, daily papers, tended to be very drab and not at all visually interesting. Uh, the, the front pages were often had the obituaries on them. Um, imagine opening your paper every day to that and almost solid walls of solid uh, print, very, very little. This is just a still of the Lower East Side and here's a cartoon of Pulitzer running the world. Um, as it were, there again, the sergeant portrait, which I love so much. 
And this is Pulitzer getting a little older, a little failer. And this one is video. I'm sorry. Josh, thanks. Um, Sorry. All right, let's see. Go on. Uh, this is a yacht that we rented to sh do the shoot on because Pulitzer spent so much time on, on, on his yacht, which is called the Liberty. And he hired um, five guys to read them around the clock because he was an insomniac and uh, very, very noise sensitive. And it was 300 feet long, it was the size of a football field. Uh, it was the second largest yacht afloat in the turn of the 20th century. I think Rockefeller or Vanderbilt's yacht was slightly, slightly bigger. Oh, here we go. Now this is, this is. Thanks, there. There we go, yeah. Pulitzer is very different from someone like William Randolph Hearst, who has been shaking up the newspaper world in California, in San Francisco, comes to New York specifically to challenge Pulitzer. He, in fact, buys the newspaper that had previously been run by Joseph Pulitzer's brother, Albert, and he makes it more sensational and more flashy. Hearst could not have come from a more different background than Joseph Pulitzer. He's the classic rags to riches story. Hearst, on the other hand, is a, a riches to riches story if there ever was one. William Randolph Hearst at Harvard majored in showgirls theater and newspapers, read the world every day religiously, and decided that he knew how to run a newspaper. I am convinced that I could run a newspaper successfully to clip some leading journal as the New York World, which is undoubtedly the best paper of that class, which appeals to the people, and which depends for its success upon enterprise, energy, and startling originality. Hearst bought the morning journal only a few months after Albert Pulitzer sold it. Hearst is now going head to head with the man he admires the most, Joseph Pulitzer. Hearst immediately goes after the major illustrators, the major editors, the major writers, the major columnists who work for Pulitzer, and he steals them all away. And now the yellow kid was in Hearst's paper. So both of these papers became associated with this cartoon. That's the origin of the phrase yellow journalism. The circulation battle becomes epic they both drop their prices, they work on the same stories, and they criticize each other by name. These two were going head to head in trying to sell to everybody. So they were trying to top each other all the time with the most amazing headlines, the wildest crusades, the craziest stunts. Poets are paid for Nellie Bly to go off around the world and try to set a world record for circling the globe. There was never a dull day in that competition between Hearst and Pulitzer. So every act of irresponsible journalism William Randolph Hearst's journal was doing, the world would copy it and engage in it. So when the Hearst papers reported something at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Pulitzer people put it in their 4 o'clock edition. Famously, Hearst runs an item in his paper about a colonel with an unpronounceable name. Reflip W. The news. The world republished it verbatim in the paper, at which point Hearst announced that this colonel's unpronounceable last name was actually an anagram for we 
pilfer the news. And he now had evidence that the only place Pulitzer could have possibly gotten his story was by stealing it from the journal, and therefore no reader should trust anything he read in the Pulitzer papers, should instead buy the journal. So you can see how mad this stuff gets. Um, this is a battleship, a US battleship called the Maine, which uh, goes into uh, Havana Harbor in 1898 and blows up. Uh, no one knows to this day what blew it up. It probably was a uh, magazine, of one, of the, uh, mag one of the bombs in the magazine probably went off, but that was not what that was not what Hearst wanted to do. He wanted to have a war with, uh, with, the, with the Spains, and uh, they had their war, a terrible war. Um, the main explosion caused by bomb or torpedo, nonsense, of course. So um, Pulitzer was reluctant initially to get involved in this stuff. He had tried to stop a war and actually had stopped a war between potential war between Britain and the United States about a, the United States about a meaningless uh, bit of turf in Venezuela just three years before. But at this point, Hearst's Hertz paper, uh, the journal, was way out ahead of the world, and Pulitzer, for the first time, was not selling the most papers in the United States. So he, too, pitched into this nonsense. And um, although, although he knew better, and later, was very unhappy about his behavior. Some people believe, and I think I do, that both the Columbia Journalism, Journalism School, which Pulitzer funded a tune of a million bucks, and the Pulitzer Prizes were the result of his sense of his responsibility for this unnecessary war. The war itself made very little sense, and uh, the Americans had, as usual, investments in Cuba. The Spanish were 3,000 miles away and were an aging, uh, failing power at that point. So they didn't want this war at all. They certainly wouldn't have blown up a battleship in Havana Harbor. But the fallout from the war, apart from our, our crazy relations with Cuba, um, we, as a result of the war, got three more properties. We got Puerto Rico as a territory. We got Guam, and we got the Philippines, which was a much, much more horrible and bloody war. Three years before Pulitzer had, had editorialized, <clears throat> when he stopped this Venezuelan nonsense, colonialism will only give us inflated ideas about our self-importance and cultural superiority, a loathsome deception. Colonialism will divert us from the real work which is internal, giving our citizens health, education, and welfare. H-E-W, there it is, in uh, 1895. Um, finally, tonight, that's just, that's the Spanish-American War uh, sensationalism stuff, that mad, mad Spaniard with. Uh, the next enterprise after this crazy event, this is the journal, was, uh, and again, here we are being colonial power, was um, the Panama Canal. It's a long story. I'll try to make it as short as possible. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was then president of the United States. And for good reason, there was a desire to have a transcontinental canal for shipping it, going around. The tip of South America took too long. It's like 80 days. It was ridiculous. It cost a lot of money. Uh, the French had already started the project years before. Oh, first of all, we invented Panama because Nicaragua wouldn't allow us to build a canal there, which is the most sensible place. But in any event, the Americans, um, the Congress bought up the assets of the French company, which for the tune of 40 million bucks. And uh, uh, Pulitzer got on this thing and said, where did the $40 million go to? It disappeared. Um, so uh, let, me, let me read this to you, because it's a little hard to, let me read a little bit of this to you. Roosevelt wanted to, I'm, I'm rambling, so let me do it in prose. 
Roosevelt wanted to construct a canal in Panama following the failure of a French enterprise to do the job. He ordered the U.S. to pay $40 million to acquire the assets of an entity called the New Pan Panama Canal Company. Then things get murky. Um, contemporary commentary suggested that the French government gave the money to a liquidator for distribution to its investors. But uh, an uh, insider who knew about the deal said that the $40 million wasn't paid to the French, but ended up being paid to J.P. Morgan, who distributed $15 million to that liquidator and the rest of it to investors in the U.S. Uh, in a U.S. financial syndicate. The two of the lead investors were a guy called Douglas Robinson, who was Roosevelt's brother-in-law, and Clark P. Taft, who was Vice President Taft's brother. So they had their fingers in the till. Till um, <clears throat> after the world attacked the deal, Roosevelt accused Pulitzer's paper of practicing every form of mendacity known to man. Uh, meanwhile, the world kept on this, even though Pulitzer was ill and blind and uh, very much afraid of going to jail. Uh, so they hired an Englishman, an English attorney, to look into the assets of the new Panama Company. I've never known in my lengthy experience of company matters any public corporation having so completely disappeared and removed all traces of existence as the new Panama Canal Company. So the court, the uh, Congress, Roosevelt went to Congress. Congress laughed at him because he, he said, where's the 40 million bucks? And finally, the case went to the Supreme Court. And, and on January 3rd, 1911, the Supreme Court handed down a complete victory for Pulitzer and for, more importantly, uh, freedom of the press. So look at the scale of this thing. It's really quite remarkable. Those are obviously the gates. There's Teddy and his. And that's it. So that's basically it. Um, I would love question. Thank you very much.